we begin. Uh, I am pleased to present uh, for our second speaker for the fourth annual Spring Conference on Creativity, my friend, Panyo Reyes Cardenas. Cardenas. I said yes, that's not right. Cardenas. Think of the Cardinals. The Cardinals, right. The St. Louis Cardinals, right? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, uh, I was really pleased when uh, Paniel wrote to me and said he would be in the United States this spring. And I said, you should come. And he said, I should. <laughs> and, uh, and we worked it out. So he has been with us this past week, and perhaps not for the last time, I hope. Um, and we've had a, a, a wonderful week of uh, research and residence. And I told him, you realize everyone who comes here has to give a residency lecture. And he says, oh, oh if I must. And I said, and it turns out. <laughs> that what you are interested in right at the moment fits in perfectly with our spring creativity conference and so we kill two birds with one stone except I don't like that metaphor um, how about we capture two birds later to release them with one hand yeah. You think so? Okay. All right. <laughs> you can think of the snake rope metaphor. Uh, like yeah, I was going to say, yes, up, uh, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, Paniel and I and uh, my dear spouse were at the snake road photographing snakes. And there was a particular northern uh, 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 moccasin who was not interested in our company, but he took stock of us and, yes. and went the other way um, uh, in any case. But then there was that beautiful rough green snake. Absolutely. Who posed. Yeah, he posed to us and <laughs> we're so showy. <laughs> you know, for those of you who don't know what the snake road is, just Google it. That's all I have to say. There's only one in the world and it's here. So nice. in any case, uh, uh, Paniel is, a, uh, is an expert on purse and uh, uh, medieval philosophy and a number of other things. Today he's here to talk to us about the aesthetic consequence of experience in classical pragmatism. Welcome, Paniel, and uh, hopefully not for the last time. Thank you. Thank you for such a kind welcome. Um, I really feel like I, you know, my flight is tomorrow and I really wouldn't like to go, but I have to, but uh, I'm definitely thinking in available dates to come back soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, um, you know, they, be, being so privileged to use this year of um, research I'm doing at the moment, um, to come to the Institute is, is a massive privilege and I'm just uh, nothing but thankful about the opportunity to be here. And I'm actually very delighted to be able to present this work for you because this work actually has been the fruit of, you know, an ongoing process of inquiry. I have many people to thank about what I've been doing here. And um, one of them is Bok. I do remember that Bob was the first person who invited me to read art as experience and I'm so happy that he's around because you know he'll he'll see the fruits of his suggestion. He did it back in 2017 I think he was in Brazil at the at the Sao Paulo uh, conference in pragmatism. So I'm I'm, I'm 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 very happy that he might be able to see some of the stuff I've done with his suggestion and the the the, the and uh, last but not least, I, sh I should give a word of thanks to my student and collaborator, uh, Simone marquez Cervan. She's been an, an amazing help in this process, and it's just been very inspiring to work with a student at that level that, you know, you feel that you, 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 you however that, however little, you, you build a little community of inquiry that helps you, you know, to, to you know, to kind of overcome your own sort of uh, uh, pro boundaries of your own kind of limitation. So it was really nice. Uh, and I can say that um, this is the project of, uh, of, 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 of a long process. It's, it's been a couple of years of, of research. And so that it, it actually has been published this um, as in, in, a, in, in a journal in Tunisia by a friend, uh, Al, uh, Handi Mlika, he's got a journal and it's called Al Mukatabad. By the way, Al Mukatabad was, was the name, um, Al Mukatabad is, a, is, a, is an Arabic word 
that is not always but somehow equivalent to philosophy because um, if you want to find the medieval Arab Arabic philosophers, where, where did they have the hardcore philosophy? You'll have to look in the treatises that they did, the works they did, they called al Kataba, their discussions. So I was very happy to be part of a special issue of al Kataba, this journal, and, um, and who was a journal on, on the history of interpretation of art. Uh, and I was happy to kind of sneak in there with, with a work on American pragmatism, which is, uh, which is something I, I really enjoy doing. Um, so um, having said that, and, and thank you, Handy Mikla will be very pleased that he, you know, this publication is kind of getting a lot of um, interest, how hopefully, you know, it's kind of um, giving me, every now and again I get nice, questions from people who read the article and it just came out last year so we're very pleased to see that of course you know like have more readers than the reviewer <laughs> so um, so having said that uh, well another thing I, I should say about this is in the in the interim of doing this and other projects and coming here to the Institute um, I have to say um, well it's not flattery. I know, you know, Randy's my host, but I'm not saying this for because of that. And Randy kind of was a key person to help me to get a consistent interest in Josiah Royce. So uh, I wrote a book on Josiah Royce last semester, and I, I, I'm, I can't wait for that to come out. Hopefully, it will come out with Lexington Books in a few months. But part of the interest there is to recover um, what is not always explicit. You know, using Brandom's famous or infamous phrase, philosophy is about making things explicit. So, in a way, I'm trying to make explicit uh, the sort of powerful idea of experience that was underlying in the classical American pragmatists. So that's that's what the, the the talk is about. The talk is going to be about three classical pragmatists, of course, Peirce, uh, the founder of the tradition, William James. And John Dewey. So I, I owe, you know, I owe that for a lot of people to, you know, interest in me in different aspects of this. For the first part, I should say I'm very grateful to Chris Hoogway. He he was my PhD supervisor, and he kind of um, helped me to see the relevance and the importance to pairs of the pragmatic maxim. And I am one of those people who believe that you couldn't be fully fledged pragmatist if you couldn't accept or adopt the pragmatic maxim. So that was one of the things I was considering here and considering his the kind of aesthetical outcome of pragmatism as an outcome of the pragmatic maxim, I think I am one of the bold people who is kind of daring to say that. Uh, for William James as well, I'm, 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 I, I just coordinated, I was very privileged to coordinate a special issue of William James' studies along with a friend, Dan Herbert. We coordinated a, a, a special issue of William James' studies um, on the relationship between Peirce and James. And I was very pleased to have that opportunity because it gave me an opportunity to explore the relationships between Peirce and James and how Peirce himself and this is something I'm going to try to say below <laughs> in the in the talk or, or further on. Um, it, it's that Peirce himself record, acknowledged himself as a radical empiricist, you know. And and Peirce, curiously enough, James kind of said, "Well, you could be, uh, you know, I don't see a necessary relationship between pragmatism and uh, and my." my philosophy called radical empiricism, but actually Perth did see that connection and Perth was kind of very uh, uh, inspired by that connection and I think that was a key element of some of the later work in Perth um, where he kind of consolidates the static venue uh, of, the, of the pragmatic maxim. And finally, like I said before, Bob uh, kind of recommended me to read uh, Arthur's experience, so I endeavor uh, a little 
itinerary of readings on Dewey's tradition and I so I was very grateful to find the essential Dewey who was very key to sort of um, help me out to, to get a summary of the views that Dewey defended over the years but one thing I was quite surprised to see uh, quite often was that uh, Dewey had this underlying kind of um, radical openness to experience and there's a very many number of writings that we could quote here, but especially, you know, uh, 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 people doing philosophy of education quote a lot of his pedagogical creed. And this is a, this is a very short essay, and it's just a very short essay, it's kind of like a manifesto really, but, but he, all he talks about, or mostly what he talks about there is about how do we have to be radically open to experience. And so, so this led me to think that there was a very important underlying connection, not always explicit again, between maybe not even explicit for Dewey himself, which is something a little bit bold to say, but there was a very important connection with, go, undergoing between his sort of radical openness to experience that somehow he got from Person James, and uh, as well as uh, his later work in um, aesthetics. And this is basically what, what I aim at in this talk, is to show you how pragmatism has a, a strand of the pragmatic maxim, or pragmatism as I understand it, uh, as being unleashed by the use of adoption of the pragmatic maxim, will help us to have a, an aesthetic stance or an aesthetic appreciation of experience. And in Dewey, I see this very powerfully so in his work, Art as Experience. Now, many Dewey scholars, like my friend um, uh, Claudio Viale in, in, um, in Argentina, they think that there was a, a, an aesthetic shift in uh, Dewey's thought, especially after he collaborated in the Barnes Foundation, you know, curating a, a, a lovely collection of art by Barnes and the Barnes Foundation. Uh, and, 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 and they seem to think that, that it was from this moment on when Dewey actually became aware of the importance of art. But in my opinion, you know, I'm not denying that, which is very well historically grounded. I'm, 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 I'm not going to deny that. I, what I'm actually going to try to say is that, yes, but there's something else going on. You know, is the, is the working of the pragmatic maxim in his scenery, into, <laughs> you know, there was, a, there was a moment of neoplatonic appreciation in the last talk, so I'm going to cling on to that and say, yeah, there's always the, 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 the sheer idea of, you know, what the pragmatic maxim unleashes was kind of work, having an inner working on, pers on, on Dewey's ideas and kind of generated this appreciation for, uh, for, for, for um, aesthetics. So what I'm trying to say, <laughs> sorry for the long, long introduction, but what I'm trying to say in a nutshell in this presentation is that there is a very important and natural connection between the pragmatic maxim on the one hand and the, and the, and the value of experience as, a, as, as, a, as aesthetic. So that, that's the purpose of the talk, uh, so hopefully I'll be able to to do that in what's left <laughs> of time. I actually should keep an eye on the time. Yeah, I still have some time. So um, so the outline of the talk is gonna be in that order I, that I kind of presented in the summary. So how I see a relationship between pragmatism, experience and aesthetics. Then I'm gonna move on to Peirce and say a little bit about how aesthetics uh, occupy a very important kind of place in Peirce's philosophy. And finally, uh, well, sorry, not finally. After that, <laughs> I'll move on to William James. I, uh, I wish I could move on, move on, on to more aspects of William James philosophy, but basically what I want to pick up today is his radical openness to experience. And I think both Peirce and James were kind of intellectual fathers of, uh, of uh, John Dewey, and they gave him um, the, the, the basis for his approach to aesthetics. That's, that's kind of the, the, the thesis I like to defend today or, or to uphold today. 
and uh, maybe say a little bit well if I have any time left but I that so because I tend to kind of <laughs> talk a bit too much but sometimes I like uh, well I'd like to just show you some interest I have in doing further work on Roy Santayana, Lewis and other pragmatists Jane Addams for example so there's something there's an, a number of things I like to do so hopefully that will give me good opportunities to come back to the Institute and talk about my more of these things but for today only the three William, J the, sorry, Charles and the Spurs, William James, and uh, John Dewey. So, pragmatism and aesthetics. In this presentation, like I said, we will consider how aesthetics occupies a prominent place in classical pragmatism, and not, it's not an accident. That's what I want to say. In my opinion, this is due to a liberating effect that pragmatism has against dichotomies that have divided the aesthetics and the epistemic on the you know like we have what Dewey criticizes as the spectator theory of knowledge this kind of a modern uh, tendency to see um, knowledge as something detached from other aspects of our of our, of our, of our worldly experience in my opinion that one of the powerful ideas of pra pragmatism, and we can find some of these interesting ideas in Peirce's early papers. Uh, Peirce had this uh, kind of seminal collection of papers in his Journal of Speculative Science. Um, uh, it was a series that, in which he criticized a number of Cartesian approaches to philosophy and approaches to epistemology. And one of the things, he, he still doesn't talk explicitly about the pragmatic maxim there, but there's a number of seminal things. One of the kind of things that have drawn the attention of a lot of Persian scholars and other scholars is um, Peirce's, um, Peirce's kind of early theory of categories. Who's got, uh, uh, and I thought uh, with Randy about this before, uh, we, we, said, we kind of noticed that there's a, mm. this kind of a powerful idea of quality of feeling as, as, as an element of what he later on will call firstness. And it's got a very powerful kind of um, aesthetic value to it. But um, that's, that's, that's one of these seminal papers, but it's not the only one. And, and one of them is, is questions concerning certain faculties claimed for man. And, um, and another one is um, consequences of foreign capacities. And some of the things, per, some of the curious things that Peirce says in these papers is that Cartesianism um, um, imposes doubt in, imposes doubt in such a way that leads us to um, imposes something that he calls artificial doubt. And this kind of uh, attitude, philosophical attitude, will lead us to sort of establish dichotomies where um, dichotomies that are not necessary. One of the kind of prominent dichotomies he criticizes there is of course this dichotomy between subject and object, right? Like. Um, between a mind that knows and the world that is known. But uh, another one of those dichotomies he explores there is um, why, should you, why should you separate um, your, um, your construction of different concepts about reality from your experience in aspects that are not expli explicitly intellectual about your experience? So, for example, your emotions. Why your emotions should be detached from your concept of law, for example? And this will lead us, ultimately lead us to some paradoxical attitudes to life, really, because um, it's a bit as though, um, think about when uh, contemporary philosophers talk about that, what they call qualia, right? Um, so. Imagine yourself trying to describe redness to a blind person. Can you detach your concept of redness from, from, your, from your experience of seeing how red things look like for you? Well, hardly so. Because, because and, I, I mean, you could, you could formulate a, a kind of um, a way of, of trying to, to convey 
Um, the, the number of things that fall into this kind of spectrum of the light, as it were, but there will be an essential thing that is missing there, you know? And, and I think Peirce is picking up in the anti-Cartesian anti papers of, uh, of this early time, he's picking up into this dichotomy that we establish with emotion reason, you know? And in a nutshell, if you allow me to summarize this, he tells us in, in another series later on called Illustrations on the Logic of Science, he tells us, do not doubt in your, in your, in your intellectual mind what you don't doubt in your heart. You know? and, and of course, he means uh, stuff that kind of comes from Cartesian skepticism, but he also means the division between reason and emotion that we do. You know, like as if emotions didn't have anything to say to us in our formation of experience. And I think this is one of the reasons why Peirce so much appreciated um, William James's uh, radical empiricism, because actually it doesn't only include um, the, the discrete elements of an experience, but actually the dynamic and continuous uh, context, contextual stream of experience. Um, so this is, I said a lot <laughs> for just the first slide, but this will help us through the, uh, you know, through the, through the rest of the presentation because actually it's summarizing a little bit of what is going to be said. So this revolutionary view of experience is present in, in this classical pragmatist. And I defend that Peirce, James and Dewey, they, they, they all kind of consciously adopted this radical openness to experience. So, in short, uh, basically saying that what William James called his radical empiricism, it, it was embraced both by Peirce and by Tui as, as a way of understanding the pragmatist philosophy. So these are the classical pragmatists that we all know, Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, John Dewey, and there's some other some other important uh, characters I, I wish I had the time to, to sort of uh, present you with kind of this connection with the aesthetical aspect of the pragmatic, the aesthetical consequence of the pragmatic maxim. Um, one of them is Jane Addams, Clarence C. Lewis, George Herbert Mead, Joe Santayana, Josiah Royce, and Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Even him uh, ma made it to this list because I think his approach uh, to the philosophy of law kind of had an, a, an imprint of, of, of an element of pragmatism. Anyway, but the ones I'm going to focus today are these three, the three classical pragmatism, pragmatists, uh, Peirce, James and Dewey. So, um, and then when, when you find, you know, classical literature on, if, if, you know, if you're a kind of um, a person that firstly um, wants to get a, a, a sort of a general view of what pragmatism is, what pragmatism is, you probably will come across um, wonderful words like, you know, there's famous words by Hilary Putnam, um, Richard Bernstein, for example, in 2010, 2010, he published a book called The Pragmatic Turn, and influenced a number of people, like trying to tell them like, what the pragmatist tradition is about. Um, and he came up with a number of things. I think, I, think, I think he didn't come up with these ideas on its own. On his own, he actually used some, some, in, some previous interpretations of what, kind of broadly speaking, the pragmatist tradition is. Some of them coming from Susan Hack, some of them coming from Hilary Putnam. Um, and others, you know. And, and in between those people, actually, I was happy to see the name of my supervisor, Chris Hugway, made it into it because he, he edited for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is one of the first resources you get when you want to find out what pragmatism is. Um, so, broadly speaking, pragmatism has some of these traits, some of these characteristics, okay? Um, I wouldn't like to stop so much in them, just to say that, you know, like, they, they look like nicely uh, shaped out by Richard Bernstein, I'm quoting verbatim, 
Um, I just want to say that they see it as an attitude. They see it as a kind of an attitude in philosophy that has these traits. But in my opinion, if we really want to know what pragmatism is about, we need to come back to Peirce himself. Uh, who, and um, even, if, even if we are kind of defenders of Rorty's view of pragmatism, which is a very kind of new pragmatism uh, position about the topic, even, even Rorty says, like, Peirce didn't do much about pragmatism. He just gave us the, 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 the word and the maxim that kind of helps to unleash the tradition, but but he's one of the people who think that the stuff that he... I, I, I mean, initially he was some kind of naturalist philosopher, and then he went a little bit Lula <laughs> and did all this metaphysical work. I don't defend that view, but I still think that even if you're Rorty or Rortian, and, and you see this, um, and, and you want to vindicate what's the story of pragmatism, you couldn't avoid going back to Peirce somehow. Well, but I am on the other end of the stick, as it were. What I'm trying to say is that actually, if you really want to know what pragmatism is about, you have to come back to the, to the maxim. And Peirce himself saw the maxim as a logical principle. And something I learned, um, you know, while my supervisor, Chris Cookwick, was writing this book, Pragmatic Maxim, Essays on Peirce and Pragmatism, um, Really, you know, towards the end of his life, Peirce was really obsessed into getting a proof for his pragmatic maxim. I, I thought he was um, uh, very convinced that having a clear proof of his pragmatist, pr pragmatic maxim will give us a way of justifying how all the body of beliefs that he defended kind of naturally follow from it. And one of these things, um, I said it already in a book I published, uh, which is my PhD thesis, evolving into a book with called Scholastic Realism, um, a key to understanding Peirce's philosophy. Um, it's been a few years now. I, I you know, it was uh, the pre-pandemic times. But, uh, in, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just surprised how quickly the time goes. But, uh, but in this book, I defend that one of the things that emerge, if you want to use the pragmatic maxim, is scholastic realism, which is a metaphysical view. Anyway, about universals, by the way, talking about medieval philosophies. Uh, so, one of the four, first, in this later stage in his life, so he gave us the first kind of official published uh, version of his pragmatic maxim very early on in this series called the Illustrations of the Logic of Science. Um, especially in how to in a, in a in a very famous essay in 1978, no, 1878, how to make our ideas clear. He gave us the sort of classical formulation of of the maxim, uh, and from from then on, um, w then later on, William James, in a number of uh, public talks, he made he kind of exploited that maxim and made it famous as Peirce's principle. Uh, but Peirce wasn't entirely happy with, uh, wasn't entirely happy with how uh, William James read his maxim. And one of the things he wanted to do, in, uh, you know, in his later years, in his mature ideas, was to offer us a, a, a sort of different versions of the maxim that will help us to clarify what actually the maxim is about. Uh, so one of these, one of these uh, later versions of the maxim is this one. And what I like about it, I could have chosen a number of them, to be honest with you, but actually I chose this one because this, is, this uses the concepts of semiotics. And it seems to me that a person couldn't detach his own pragmatic maxim and his pragmatism from his semiotics and from his metaphysics. Um, so in other words, to, in order to understand what the maxim is about, you have to sort of uh, open yourself in such a way that this maxim is going to open you to a body of beliefs. And this body of beliefs is what he, what I call his pragmatist philosophy. Let's quickly, quickly read this uh, version of the, of the maxim. The entire intellectual support of any symbol consists in the two, in, oh, sorry, I lost it here. Uh, 
I'm trying to move the, the images. Oh, there you go. The entire intellectual purport of any symbol consists in the total of all general modes of rational conduct, which conditionally upon all the, the possible different circumstances and desires will ensue upon the acceptance of the symbol. And um, for those of you who like and are familiar with semiotics, especially with communication students and, and scholars, um, so what Perus is telling us here is that you have to release the interpretant, as it were. You have to release the symbol to make what it has to be. You know, the, do not block the road of inquiry, per se, so in one of his early per papers. And one of the things that kind of are unleashed in this liberation of the symbol is the number of interpretations that are going to grow should we accept that symbol. So that's the pragmatic maxim in a nutshell. And I think it's important to accept that in order to go to what follows next, which is pragmat the relationship between pragmatism and aesthetics. So we will just talking about Peirce, we will consider three points. The relationship between aesthetics with his and his system of thought, where we find aesthetics in his actual body of beliefs. And then the relationship between aesthetics and adoptive inference. Because like Bob said already, you know, there's an element of amusement, of aesthetical openness that allows us to be, uh, carry on um, creative reason. And I, I, I really wanted to stress that because this is a conference on, the, on creativity. And I think this is, this is gonna become quite relevant in Peirce's view. Um, and finally, the relationship between aesthetics and Peirce's theory of categories. Now, Unfortunately, if you're not familiar with Peirce's theory of categories, I don't want to bore you, you know, <laughs> in a Sunday afternoon with the details of it, but at least I'm going to give you a little nutshell, you know, in order to, for you to sort of, uh, if you get curious, to know where to find more about this stuff. So, how the pragmatic maxim uh, connects with aesthetics? Well, like I said before, this is one of the formulations of the maxim, the one already presented uh, above. And what, what I'd like to say about this is that in this total of all general modes of rational conduct, there are um, ideas that are so powerful, or, or realities, not ideas, realities that are so powerful in themselves, that they will be hardly contained in the language of one context of this curse. So in other words, um, knowing certain, being open to certain experiences will force you to be creative and expressive, aesthetically. So one of the many purposes, like I said, um, that Peirce wanted to achieve with its maxim is offering a level of clarity that goes beyond feelings of certainty. So for the Cartesian tradition, what knowledge is about is something that is indubitable, right? Like something you couldn't cast any doubt about. And Peirce tells us that we should not doubt intellectually what we don't doubt in our hearts. We said this already. And this consequence of the maxim, I read it as a hint to the problem between, between reason and emotion. And this is one of the dichotomies that unfortunately affect theoreticians that do uh, aesthetics, because initially they think that they have to kind of abandon their aesthetic, uh, their aesthetic um, um, strand in its own, in their own selves, and in order to make sense of it. But when you in my opinion, when you want to make reflective clarity of your aesthetic experiences, you actually have to plunge a lot more into your own aesthetic experience. I, I, know, it, I know that might be a bit strange, but bear with me. Uh, what I'm trying, Randy has a number of beautiful um, pieces of art here in this beautiful house. And one of the things that yesterday, just yesterday, he surprised me with, was Arthur Zanto um, <laughs> art. Arthur Zanto, a famous aesthetic, aesthetic, <laughs> philosopher of aesthetics, uh, 
he he had an impressive kind of uh, artistic strength to him. But actually, if you read Dante himself, you know, you kind of feel like he's kind of trying to su suppress, uh, to extend, as of an analytical philosopher. Nothing against analytical philosophers if you're watching, but watching, but, <laughs> but, but there's a limiting kind of um, sort of uh, aspect of the tradition. Uh, is it like you have to sort of capture everything in sort of the language of a limited formal representation of logic? And what? Peirce here is telling us is that we should use the maxim to liberate ourselves from that. Okay? So another dichotomy that also needs to be resolved is that of the spectator theory of knowledge. And this is, I'm using uh, Dewey's, Dewey's own expression about the topic, but I think it matches perfectly with what Peirce said. And I actually was pleasantly surprised. I mean, I, I, I not, I, I'm not sure if Nick is still watching this presentation, but he, he, he gave me the opportunity to look through uh, this, just last this Wednesday, I looked through uh, John Dewey's uh, version and, and token of, uh, of a copy of, of Peirce's collected papers. He didn't have all, all the volumes, which was interesting to see, uh, but actually it's interesting to see, I, I went through all of them page by page, I saw uh, Dewey's annotations, and I was surprised to see that one of the things that Dewey was fascinated when, when kind of persons collected papers appeared was his, um, was how Dewey was saying, or say, came to recognize, I feel I saw that. <laughs> Maybe I'm just imagining that, like, but uh, I feel Dewey realized, had a moment of insight, because if you read Dewey's um, accounts of Peirce's teaching, he was his student in Johns Hopkins University, um, and he says like, oh, this guy Peirce is very clever, but he's not the kind of philosophy he wanted to do. But then Dewey comes, many years later, Peirce was dead for, for about 50 years, he receives a, a, a copy of the collected papers and starts reading them, especially in the pragmatism volume. I, I can't quite remember which one of the volumes of the collected papers is. But that volume is all scratch, on the line, annotated, and it seems to give you a sense that Dewey was saying like, oh, how could I not notice that person was kind of the father of all these ideas? And then he published in 1934, uh, inquiry, um, sorry, logic, the theory of inquiry. And then when he published that, he, had, he dedicates the book to Peirce and says in the preface that it's all pragmatism, it's all Peirce, kind of tried to, it's, it's all what he already sort of received from the pragmatic maxim, which is something nice to see, to be honest. I was very pleased when I found that this week, just this last week. Anyway, sorry about that. That's a, a geek talking about <laughs> geeky things. A nerd talking about his uh, sort of excitement about what we found, looking at uh, uh, Dewey's collected papers. But actually, what it tells us is that there's a, there's a similarity, and at least for, from Dewey's point of view, what Peirce is doing in his early work is criticizing the spectator theory of knowledge. And just in brief, we can appreciate important consequences of, the adopt, of adopting the maxim, and this is the very way that pragmatism is a consequence of the adoption of the maxim. So one of the things that is going to radically change when we use the maxim is our conception of knowledge. Because it changes our conception of experience. Knowledge let me try to summarize that for you in very clear words, it won't be a piece of information that is meant to be catalogued in some kind of file or archive. Knowledge is a disposition, a habit of action, an expectation. And one characteristic of knowledge is that always future-oriented. Knowledge is going to be manif the, the true meaning of something I know, if I follow the maxim, it's going to come in the future. Now, there's, 
time is running out really quickly. So I wish I could have time to explain to you the con connections I see in Perseus' uses of the Maxim and what he is going to produce later on in his life called the architectonic system. But Perse generated a, a classification that was very famous back in the day, you know, back in the 19th century. Many of the polymaths of the time, they'll, one of the things they like to do is offer us a taxonomy of sciences, you know, a classification of science. A very famous German philosopher of the time, he was a superstar in his own time, Lotze, for example. Lotze was kind of a, the inspiration for a lot of people to do this kind of work of classification of the sciences. But uh, Charles and Spurs actually gave it a go. He said, like, yeah, I'm going to offer you my own classification of sciences, but I'm not going to do it based... Sorry, somebody was telling us something? No. Sure, okay? Okay. Well, I'll go check mine. Maybe just some microphone accidentally opened. I get time to give it a sip. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll carry on. So first. And I tried to be very brief about this, but uh, I get excited, so help me out. <laughs> so, first offered us his own classification of science. But the great difference with all the current classification of the sciences of the time, even the ones made by philosophers, in which obviously philosophy occupies a high place in the ladder, um, Peirce's view of philosophy, of, of the classification of sciences, actually doesn't classify knowledge as products. You know, like um, if I was gonna, so for example, what, what, how can I relate? Like people do nowadays in our own time, right? Uh, you know, if you if you have chemistry and you have sorry, chemistry and biology, what's in between? What would you say? You know, looking at the results of that kind of um, correlation. Biochemistry, right? Like, that, that'll be the kind of natural connection between them. And if you've got chemistry and uh, medicine, you know, like... Medical chemistry. Medical chemistry, and, and so on and so forth. So the classification of sciences, as it is actually operating in our, in our realms of, of, of knowledge, and now, even nowadays, depends on the products of knowledge. But Peirce was very bold about this. He, would, he was a bit venturous, and he said, what if we classify the sciences not looking at the products, not looking at the results of inquiry, but at the activities that we perform when we do inquiry? And then he came up with a classification that has two kinds, well, has a number of peculiarities. Um, but in this classification, aesthetics occupies a very prominent place. And let me show you very quickly. So the first activity you do is phenomenology. Well, he, he, call, he also calls it phaneroscopy, which is the, the science of things as they appear. Kind of the and there's an element of his first category there. And then the normative sciences. Sciences that are sinoscopic, he calls it sinoscopy, that give you a general view of the, in the intellectual activities that you pursue when you explore these sciences, they give you a, a view that is going to be normative to any other kind of branch of activity, intellectual activity you'll perform. So, Curiously enough, the first of the normative sciences is aesthetics, then ethics, and then logic. Unfortunately, I don't have time to expand on this, but let me just quickly tell you that logic, for Peirce, is kind of grounded in the principle that you should tell the truth to somebody, you know, when you say something. And, you know, like, obviously, badly summarized, but that's the... I get that's the idea. And this, because of that, logic is sublated to ethics. So 
if you really want to know how to tell the truth to other people, you, you'll worry about the preservation of that truth in your reasoning. Uh, but coming back to ethics, say like, but how do you know something is good? You know, because, and then this is a kind of platonic element in Peirce's philosophy, I believe, is because you know that the good is something that is in, is valuable, not because it's interact, not because it's, it, it works in order to serve a purpose, but it's valuable purposeless. And this is starting to sound uh, a little bit like the cant of the third critique and Schelling and other people who said that the, the truly admirable is that that is admirable in itself without purpose. Like, uh, like Kant's uh, reflective judgment. That that is admirable in itself, you know, not, in, you know, not because it serves a purpose for me but because it's admirable in itself. And I like to think, would you bear with me if I give you a silly example? Well, my example is a baby, right? You see, you know, how many of us come across a baby and say like, you know, a baby, if you look at it from the utilitarian point of view, it's something that doesn't work for anything, right? It's, it's such a burden, right? It doesn't really do any jobs. <laughs> he just takes your time and attention and care and efforts and energy. But there's some, something admirable in itself about the baby without purpose. You know, they, it really baby doesn't... A baby isn't good for anything, really. It's a, it's a, it's a good paradig paradigmatic example of something that doesn't work for anything. <laughs> but, but, but you look at the baby and you see the, the life that emanates from the baby and you get caught up on that because it's something admirable in itself without purpose. And I think this is kind of the kind of uh, admirable in itself that the person's account of aesthetics tells us. How is that normative? Well, because the first aspect of experience is actually, and let me come back as far as Aristotle Aristotle says to us, where does actually philosophy start? With admiration, with being surprised by something, something that cuts up your attention and, 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 and actually allows you to forget about your everyday things and your own self and think about something else, it's something that brings you out of yourself and it brings your mind into something else that is not you. So aesthetics is actually the ultimate principle of sort of um, us being drawn by the force of, in, of, of curiosity, inquiry, passion, you know, a sentiment of rationality. And I like that wordplay, really, that poem, a sentiment of rationality. And this is, this is actually in first, but it's, it's a little bit like this. Um, why are you rational? Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a selfless sentiment. It's a selfless love to truth. It's a selfless love to find the truth about things. So for Peirce, this is based in aesthetical. So it's sort of, this is normative for inquiry in general. Having an aesthetical attitude towards life. Okay, well, that's all I can say now about this. I wanted to say something about how, in carrying out inferences, we can use also Peirce's uh, conception of... Um, he, he presents us with three modes of inference. Uh, abduction, sorry, deduction, induction, and hypothesis or abduction or reproduction. He changes the names to it, uh, which is a logic of how you become creative and you let yourself be surprised by reality. How you let yourself be surprised by reality and by the free play of imagination in doing hypotheses. What Bob called before um, amusement. Um, this is, this is an, a very interesting paper by Peirce called um, um, A Neglected Argument for the Reality of God. 
it's just I'm just hinting on that I wish I could speak a little bit more about that and then I said to you that one of the body of reliefs that first came up with his pragmatic maxim was this uh, was a, 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 a a theory of categories, which establishes uh, some sort of metaphysics of reality, sort of uh, I mean, if it's uh, the lif different modes of being that reality can present you with. And and uh, something I really love about Peirce's definition of the theory of categories as aesthetic is that when he read William James, he said, "Actually, my categories are universes of experience." Universes of experience. It's like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a radical empiricism. It's a radical way of of being open to what experience presents me with. He did a number of things, but basically, I don't know how familiar you are with radical empiricism. But one of really interesting William James's uh, versions of um, or ways of making sense of radical empiricism is, is that traditional. British empiricism is really rubbish. It's really bad. <laughs> I know. Randy told me that rubbish. People don't understand that. It's garbage. <laughs> so, traditional empiricism is just a very limited approach to empiricism. Why? Because it's just it, it only gives you an account of your experience to a number of limited things that interact with your experience, with the universes of experience. And Peirce told us, well, Peirce tells us that we experience an possibilities, we experience facts, and we experience laws. I wish I could have more time to explain that, but uh, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that a traditional British or other kind of empiricists will tell you that the only thing you experience are facts. For example, when I look at, at, at my lectern, my lectern, sorry, <laughs> just for now, <laughs> uh, I look at this lovely glass of wine. But of course, um, the, a, a, a traditional empiricist will tell me that I, I look at a fact, you know, like a, like a frozen fact, that is not affected by time or and is kind of as isolated from the context. William James, and I I will be I will I won't talk too much about William James, but this will be enough if we get it. <laughs> um, William James will tell us, no, this is not isolated. This is a, a glass in the context of you know, it's a glass with a conjunctive relation with the lectern and with a substitute relation with the context, right? Like the context is the talk. Um, so what does it make sense for me? Because it's kind of helping me, giving me a little bit of courage to finish this talk. <laughs> oh yeah, it's work. <laughs> so um, experience never happens as a discrete arrangement of a lot of individual elements of experience. It's that kind of come into distinctive from each other, right? And this goes, this really goes back to the beginning of philosophy. If you think about the Eleatic philosophers, what was the problem with their paradoxes? You know, when you think about the paradoxes that Aquil, Aquilus and, and the tortoise, and when you think about the arrow, right? What was the problem there? Well, the problem there is that actually, if you think about time as a succession of moments, then you fall in the paradox. Or if you think about space as a succession of points, then you fall in the paradox. The problem is to think about reality as, a, as, a, as, a, as the result of a lot of individual summing points or summing atomic, atomic facts, as the early Wittgenstein used to call it. Just the early Wittgenstein, because of course the later Wittgenstein, I think he's a lot more a pragmatist than many other people. Um, so, yeah, if you ha in order to kind of account for the richness of experience, you have to account of experience as a stream of thought, as a stream, as a, a, as a manifestation of different things in relation, never not connected. 
Hmm. So, how am I doing with time? I'm, I'm doing really bad now. <laughs> uh, it's time to wind it up. It's time to wind up. Well, we're gonna have to skip the James section of it oh, and the Dewey section of it, oh. and just let me finish the first part of it. <laughs> so, um. Oh gosh, sorry, I got to. That's my problem starting with purse, because I get too excited. Anyway, but what I like to say to you, just, just to wrap up a few ideas about this, is that radical empiricism is an inspiration for aesthetics. So that is for aesthet for, it will naturally lead us to aesthetics for a number of reasons. But one of that, re or one of that important and prominent reasons to think about that way is that it opens you to the universes of experience that are always more than you expect them to be. So reality always surprises us. You know, I was thinking, oh, this is probably the, the scheme I'm gonna follow when I give my talk. But actually reality surprised me by um, the flow of time being accelerated in, in a mysterious way. And so I was left without enough time. <laughs> anyway, but um, of course I got caught up in trying to show to you how the dynamism of experience is the dynamism of a process, right? You don't get experience of objects and then you get experience of the context. You get experience of objects imbued in the context, in the stream of experience. And for that stream of experience, William James will tell us, <laughs> all of that I was going to talk about, William James will tell us that, um, sorry, this is how, William James will tell us that your stream of, ex of consciousness is something, is your, is your own acti intellectual activity trying to imbued itself in the universe of the stream of experience. So what my consciousness is, in another, in another words, is an irreducible, in a, an irreducible interaction with the stream of experience. The stream of consciousness, that imagine, I, I, Randy was really kind to me these last few days and he took me to the confluence of the Mississippi and the Ohio. And I was really excited to see where these massive rivers, they have confluence. And I like to imagine this like that. The stream of your consciousness finds the streams of experience and they, they have this confluence. And what happens there is your thinking, your, your account of what you're leaving the living being. And this brings me to the last point of the talk. <laughs> you know, look, I was going to skip all of this. But it brings me to a, a fascinating intuition I find in Dewey's artist's experience. And is this. And, and I'll finish with this. Aesthetic experience mediates the heightened life and the active commitment to the world in its highest form encompasses the identification of the I and the world. In such experience, Dewey tells us, art begins. So aesthetics is at the beginning and aesthetics is at the end of the road. The living creature in art uses materials and energies of nature in order to expand life. Thus, art is proof of human beings capable consciously restoring a union of sensation, needs and actions found in animal life. But what, what uh, Dewey tells us is that in, in art of experience, Dewey tells us that um, experience can be, you know, science will tell us how it will describe experience, but art will express experience. So ultimately, the radical openness to experience comes in art. At the very beginning and at the very end of our account of living life, right? So this is, I find that very beautiful. I don't know about you, but I find that very touching, really. Like, uh, you know, if I really want to engage with life, I'm going to artistically express what actually is living.
in this life. Well, anyway, so can I have one minute more just to summarize the whole thing? If you must. Okay, this is the, I promise, this is the real end of it. <laughs> Aesthetics is the openness to experience that values the admirable aspects of reality, a radical openness in James' sense, that becomes normative and is first established in normative sciences, and ultimately leads to the deepest engagement with experience as Dewey tells us. We aim to show, um, and I'm including my student Simone here, that there is a natural but not so evident path that ultimately allows us to state that pragmatism is a philosophical approach that leads in different ways and stages to, to aesthetic attitude. So thank you ever so much for your patience. And I, want to, I don't want to finish without saying many thanks to Randy. And I'm really very grateful to be a resident fellow of the APCT or ACPT. <laughs> Um, uh, and, you know, to present you this research, to you in the line as well, and to you in person, and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Brandon, do we have questions? Uh, Nick has a question, comment here. Uh, Nick says, fantastic presentation. I want the full paper, please. Question. What do you think about Chris's late career remark? Yet the maxim of pragmatism does not bestow a single smile upon beauty, <laughs> upon moral virtue, or upon abstract truth. The three things that alone raise humanity above animality. Mm -hmm. Here we have beauty left out of pragmatism. However, your presentation seems to show beauty as a ground of inquiry, such as you explain Pierce's classification of the normative sciences. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you, Nick, <laughs> for that uh, question. It was Nick, wasn't it? Yeah, he should come on over. <laughs> he should go be nice. blocks away. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, whatever you are. This is a drinking, this is a drinking question. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you are, bring yourself here and have a glass of wine when we talk about it. No, being serious, being serious. He says, I wish. Uh, yeah, I knew that he had stuff to there do. Small, he actually there are told small beings involved. But... <laughs> yes, yes. Well, there's aesthetic beings kind of uh, drawing his attention to the really admirable and not this. <laughs> I, love the, I love the question because it, appear, it would appear, it, you know, a, an initial view of Peirce would appear as if kind of in his first um, stage of his philosophical or writing career, he was somebody very concerned about um, scientific inquiry and things like that. And, and, and then at some point he kind of became a, an idealist philosopher who started to experiment with metaphysics. Uh, in the same sense as many people would say, like, I started experimenting with drugs. Well, you're actually, you know, like, you're caught up on it. You're not experimenting anymore. Um, uh, and I think that view of Peirce is mistaken, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Why? Well, because I think, like I said before, um, that Peirce's pragmatic maxim has a radical kind of... Um, it kind of delivers the bomb, really. It delivers, uh, delivers, you know, by accepting the pragmatic maxim, you're willing to accept that reality is going to unfold in ways that you didn't expect. And this gives you the radical openness that allows you to find the really admirable in the world. So I think his metaphysics, and especially his architectonic philosophy, that as you know, Nick, and I'm sure you say this in your book, um, this, this, um, the architectonic uh, placing of aesthetics at, at, the, at the very core of the normative sciences gives us this radical openness we're talking about, right?
because only the, the true admirable will, will give you the key of the of the selfless interpretation of the reality that unfolds not only before you but with you so yes I I, I would say um, and then um, there's something else I should mention by the way um, there's also all, um, this element in Peru's, uh, um, you know, there's more and more talk about, uh, in, as you know, in the later parts of the sumum bonum, the sumum bonum, which is uh, something that is the, 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 the maximum admirable, the maximum, you know, in the normative sciences works as the hypothesis of what will be the maximums of admirable, the maximum of the ethical, and the maximum of the logical. And this kind of draws us back to the medieval and their appreciation of the transcendentals of being. The true, the good, the beautiful, the unum, the unity. And, and they also call the aliquid, but I'm not going to get into that one. But yes, I do think that the later person actually has a growing realization of the important uh, the prominent place of aesthetics and the aesthetic, uh, and the aesthetic appreciation, not only of science and life and inquiry, um, but even of being. And it leads us to the point where he sees that the most, the utmost kind of aesthetical hypothesis you can actually give is the hypothesis of God. Because it's the is the kind of utmost uh, hypothesis of where your mind muses reality. So yeah, yet yeah, I think I, in my opinion, the later person actually is radically open that way, and it becomes a mystician. So Panyo, I've never heard anyone call Percy radical empiricist before. This is not something that I'm accustomed to. And I don't think I buy it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the reason is this. Uh, radical openness, I think, I can, I can go with that. Uh, radical openness to him meant radical openness to something that, so I don't read the pragmatic maxim the way you do. And I noticed that you chose an articulation of the pragmatic maxim that's very different from the one that most people use. Because the, uh, good luck getting all the way around me. There you yeah, go. Yeah, you did it. <laughs> and so uh, um, the pragmatic maxim is normally a conceptualist maxim, uh, which is to say it's limited to how we, co to how we conceptualize things. Uh, and so for 35 years, the pragmatic maxim had nothing to do with symbol at all, and everything to do with concepts. You chose the version of the maxim that had moved over into symbolization, uh, and this could be a very long conversation, but the question is, is uh, so since most people have focused on the conceptual pragmatic maxim, that how you conceptualize the object uh, uh, and how you conceptualize the consequences. That's what brings the object and the consequences together, is the process of conceptualization. Mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not radical empiricism. It's nowhere close. This is more like neo-scholastic um, realism. Uh, well, conceptual realism. Um, and so, what you're focusing on is a rather late movement in, in, in Peirce's thought in which he was unsatisfied with the pragmatic maxim as he had given it uh, many times, many times before. Um, uh, and I wonder what the justification is for focusing on this symbolic version of the pragmatic maxim as opposed to the one that's much more much more common for first scholars. Okay, thank you, thank you. Right, I wait for the camera. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. It's oh, there. I'm bigger now. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Wow, Remy, thank you for the question. Yes, I agree with you. Peirce was 
increasingly dissatisfied with its own earlier formulation of the maxim in how to make our ideas clear. Mm -hmm. He kind of was, to be in all honesty, he was kind of forced by James into the matter, really. He was forced by James into understanding what he actually meant by the maxim. And when you say forced by James, what you mean is, is that James got it wrong and therefore he needed, correct him. He needed to, to, yeah. to do a pragmatic clarification yeah, of the yeah, pragmatic exactly. maxim. Yeah, because he didn't agree with James. It's not because he did agree. Yes, yes. I think, well, I think I, that's fascinating. And I, and I hope, I really hope that, that special issue on, um, of William James' studies on the purse and James' relationship relationship comes out soon because I give an extensive argument about this topic. But, uh, and I look at the evidence historically spell out, but, uh, and I, I get a little bit of the shakes when you ask me this because, you know, I have the most, uttermost respect to your opinion on this matter. And I actually tried to follow it at, at many places that I've written this. But um, I have to disagree in saying that he was so dissatisfied that he didn't recognize his later interpretations of the maxim in the earlier ones. Well, but I think we agree that he was dissatisfied. He was dissatisfied in the use of the maxim. And he wanted to give us a, a full account of the maxim at the end of his life. And in doing so, he was, if you allow me to say this, obsessed in trying to give us even a proof of the maxim. Mm -hmm. um, and, in, and he did all sorts of things to try to That's prove. That's the opposite of radical openness. Mm. Nobody who's radically open. Yeah, sounds like tenacity, like Bob would say. Of a yeah. maxim. Well, but be, I don't think this is, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you saying that a, there was an element of tenacity. <laughs> yeah, okay. There. Well, you're the one who used the word obsessed, so. Uh, yeah. I agree with you. He was obsessed, but it's, the reason I, I raised this question, I've never heard anybody suggest that Peirce was a radical empiricist. Well. In that, I'm not alone. Peirce himself said it. Peirce himself uh, uh, wrote a number of things where he praised... I wonder what he meant by it. Yeah, he meant, he meant, in a nutshell, he meant the radical openness to the three universes of experience. That's not radical empiricism. That's the opposite of radical empiricism. Well, um, probably you and James will say that. But Peirce <laughs> himself was thinking that I am a Jamesian in this respect. Because he saw his universes of experience as continuous to, 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 to the core hypothesis of radical empiricism, that is, do not, uh, do not take out of your, your, your consciousness of experiences and, well, let me rephrase that. Do not take anything out of your consciousness of experience as it comes along. And Peirce will say that the universes of experience are actually manifested in that, in that consciousness of experience. And he thinks that you find their possibilities, facts, and laws. Yes, regularities. Okay, so now we're just arguing about who gets to define radical empiricism. Well, um, <laughs> Peirce is... Because Peirce is, James, James would say, that's not what I mean. <laughs> I'm not and, so and sure. Here's the reason. No, so that the relations are given with experience and no, but here's the difference. There's no trans-empirical uh, trans support required as a substructure of experience in order to have the experience as it's experienced. And what you're giving is the substructure that supports the experience. No, I don't think so. I think, I think Peirce's categories are entirely a posteriori. They're entirely the product of our engagement with experience. So, I think... Yeah, okay. They're supposed to be. 
They're not supposed to be a priori. That's exactly, true. exactly. They're not supposed to be a priori metaphysics. No, okay. <laughs> so because of that, I no. think they are... Pro they're uh, well, pro that's the key in your argument then, isn't it? It is. It's, it's per one, it's purse. Two, it can't be a priori. Three, the categories must be from experience. Four, therefore, we have to be radically open to them. Yeah, you got me right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I don't know what time it is. It's 20 past, so maybe oh, I'm over the time, time. but... Uh, uh, Sabrina, is there anything in the chat? Uh, not be on next. Okay. Well, Thank you, everyone. Let's take, let's take our break, then. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>